The information contained in this podcast is an expression of opinion and does not constitute investment advice. This is the Gold Money Podcast with Felix Moreno, keeping you up to date with expert opinion on precious metals and the markets. Hello and welcome to the Gold Money Podcast. I'm Felix Moreno and I'm here today with Todd Ferguson of TF Metals, one of the most interesting voices in the metals industry, runs a wonderful website. Hi, Todd. Felix, pleasure to visit with you. So um, for those of us, uh, for those of our viewers and listeners who haven't actually listened to your previous appearances on Gold Money, tell us a bit about TF Metals and what you do there. Well, it's a website specifically dedicated to uh, owning, trading, stacking, physical precious metal, be it gold or silver. I, I kind of fell into this a couple of years ago through my involvement with a website called Zero Hedge. Uh, I, I like to think it's different. It, uh, the, it's a friendly community. We're all there to help each other. There's not people that tear each other down or post inflammatory things. And so I invite people to check it out. It's tfmetalsreport.com. TF is Turd Ferguson, metalsreport.com. And I highly recommend it. Uh, so Thank the you. tagline, the tagline for your website is the end of the road for Keynesianism, and you've yes. been you've been telling us about how the the current economic model based on uh, uh, Keynesianism and also the you could say the Chicago monetary school, but they're really using the same methodology as Keynesianism, and they have most of the same ideas, right? Sure, yeah. And, and uh, it, sorry, go on. No, no, I know. I apologize. I, I, for stepping on what you were saying. It is, though, that is kind of the tagline, is that this this experiment, this Keynesian experiment has been going on now for the better part of, what, 80 years, uh, maybe almost 90. And uh, it, it's reached the end of the road, which is just a mathematical certainty. And it, it, you can either deny that or you can accept it for what it is. I mean, it, at some point, the math just fails to work any longer. This This leveraged debt-based fractional reserve system falls on its own, uh, and and that's where we are. Has it ever not fallen on its own? Because this has been tried before many times in history, hasn't it? Well, exactly. Uh, this is nothing surprising that has turned out this way. It had years of prosperity, or what seemed to be prosperity. But in the end, again, the math is a certainty, and it it, it falls. I, Felix, it makes me think. I, I just read, I just took a vacation, which was great fun. And and while I was on vacation, I read this new book from Dan Brown, you know, the, <laughs> the uh, Da Vinci Code guy? Yeah, sure. And it, at, at it, the book itself is about a, a, a guy that wants to, uh, is worried about world population growth, okay? Yeah. And how it, it has grown exponentially. Okay, without getting into whether that's a valid concern or whatever. I, what I was, as I was reading it, I kept thinking and extrapolating that instead to world debt growth and how mm-hmm. you can look at these problems and either bury your head in the sand and go back to kind of a denial fallback position to help you feel better that, well, uh, you know, kind of a normalcy bias. So I don't even want to think about that. Or you can recognize it for what it is, a mathematical certainty that this isn't going to end well, and you can begin to prepare for it yourself. And that's what that's what we try to do at TF Metals Report. I I don't want to get into the whole world population growth uh, debate no, because no, I, I because it could take us ages. I mean, it's a very interesting topic. But uh, personally, I happen to like people, and I don't mind if we have more of them. But uh, on the other hand, debt uh, debt doesn't need to grow exponentially. There's been long periods in history when it hasn't, and uh, every time it has grown exponentially, it's ended up in disaster, hasn't it? Exactly, and and again, that's where we are now, and that's why. This idea, um, I just laugh, it's laughable, this idea that the Fed is somehow going to extricate themselves from uh, essentially being the U.S. Treasury market, which is what they've become at $85 billion a month. Mm. The idea that now they can step away and not have a, a terribly detrimental impact on interest rates and then economic growth and tax revenues, I mean, it the entire thing will rapidly spiral out of control if the Fed were to try to uh, exit. In fact, their really only option, and it's written in the FOMC minutes, is to potentially increase quantitative easing. That's more likely than than decrease. And exactly. again, it's just simply the math. Who's yeah? Let, let's look at the math. Uh, the math. Uh, U.S. Um, sovereign debt is standing at over a hundred percent of GDP. Yes. Correct. Mm-hmm. And. Uh, and basically, the the U.S. Um, Federal Reserve is buying 
um, increasing proportions of every single debt issue that comes out, every single new issue. Right. And they're also they're also buying up stuff from other people, from banks and so on, of the um, outstanding debt. So they're, as you say, they're becoming the treasury market. Exactly. And they are now put themselves in this position where they have no other option but to continue. And they, you know, the interesting thing about the last six weeks or so is the move in interest rates, even while the Fed is propping up the market. I mean, mm-hmm. that's rather astonishing. The 10 year Treasury note in the U.S. has gone from one point six percent to two point seven percent. I mean, that's a move of what, 60 percent? Yes, and, I mean, it's just, and it's actually very interesting how many people have been spooked by it because you can see huge, even in very traded stocks like, say, Apple, uh, you can have huge moves in the price of the stock and some people get worried, some don't. But whenever the treasury market moves, money managers just get absolutely panicked because uh, they're all in it and they're all in it up to their heads. That's absolutely right. And if you begin to sense, I mean, you want to, it's like any other market, any other bubble, you don't want to be... Uh, caught in the mass of people heading to the exit at the same time. And so as soon as people thought, oh, boy, maybe this means rates will go up, it just started this mass exodus. And that that move in the in a 10 year treasury or in the long bond is, I mean, historical in nature, the, the severity of the move. And it just goes to show you the Fed really does not have any viable option to exit. We are. You mentioned that outstanding debt that we that the U.S. has at sixteen trillion plus dollars. Hmm. The line item on the federal budget def on the federal U.S. federal budget of interest on the debt actually declined in fiscal twenty thirteen because the Fed continues to move to the shorter end of the yield curve where interest rates are lower and continues to push interest rates down. It actually declined from about four hundred and fifty billion down to. Under four hundred billion dollars. That's right. Even though the debt increased, again, you can't do that forever. And if interest rates uh, were to then increase from right now, we I think the Fed is looking or the Treasury is looking at average yield of about three percent. That were to go to six, that were to go to nine. What would that do to the interest component on the national debt that has to come out of the federal budget every year? And they just have to print it, wouldn't it? The, the exactly. choice they have. Exactly. And, and so interest rates must be kept low, must be. And so this idea that the Fed is going to somehow exit the Treasury market, thereby leaving it to with far more sellers than buyers, I mean, it's just nonsense. It's, it's silly. Hmm. Uh, nevertheless, uh, the counter would be just plain devil's advocate here. Uh, sure. Other people have done it for longer. Japan's, ha- they have over 200% of uh, debt over GDP and they just keep on going. Um, well, there's a couple of, well, as a, what comes to mind, there's a couple of problems with that. One, look at how Japan has done economically for the last 20 years, which is probably also a function of demographics and a number of other things. But Japan, the yen is also not the reserve currency of the world either. Mm. So you, you factor in that it's the yen and the amount of uh, of that debt that is held within Japan only mitigates all of the well, not all of them. That it tends to mitigate what could have what should have been poten- more potentially. De- I guess does that make sense it, it, to have the U.S. try to attempt this as the world's reserve currency and with the world awash in treasury obligations? I. I think is a, almost comparing apples to oranges, at least in my book. Uh, probably. I mean, it's just it's a matter of size. But the the thing is that pff, we're going to see some very big moves in Japan very rec- very soon. Sure. At least, yeah. And that's what some people are saying. And uh, I don't know. Could the U.S. go as far as Japan? I I doubt it very much, personally. No, I don't, I, I not not even what we would call successfully. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so talking about um, gold, before we start looking at the gold market, I'd really like to ask you, what do you consider are the gold uh, price and the gold fundamentals? What do you actually use to value gold? Oh, boy, that's a good question, Felix. Uh, you mean, do what do I personally use or what does the, the world, what do most analysts use? No, no, what do you use? Because again, I mean, well... We all know uh, what most analysts do. I mean, it's... The, 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 See, they just lump it with other commodities uh, as if it was um, oil or soybeans. Exactly. And, and when, in fact, it, you know, a lot of folks look at it as a currency cross. 
you know, as a gold uh, dollar, gold yen, gold euro, uh, and how the central banks try to manage that. I, I, how do I value gold? I think it's invaluable. And again, it, it, I don't want to say that its value is almost infinite, but in a sense it is because we don't really know the true supply of it because hmm. the price, you know, in, in Econ 101, you learn, you know, that the price is this intersection of supply and demand, sure. right? Well, how do we really know what the supply is when the price is based upon this paper futures market that is all rehypothecated physical metal leveraged up at least 100 to 1? Mm, that's you, right. You don't really know what the physical supply is. And if – so it, when you're trading this paper future – and and saying, well, the price is twelve hundred and fifty dollars. Well, okay, but if if that entire leveraged rehypothecated paper system were unwound and we were able to pull back the curtain, and I'm gonna give you as many metaphors as I can within one sentence, <laughs> um, and then you finally figure out that wait a second, there's no gold here, there's no gold in, in JP Morgan's vault, there's no there's hardly any gold in the LBMA, you know, it's all all of a sudden in China, or if you know, or if, when China finally does report again what their official holdings are, again they have not reported since two thousand nine. That's right, and that uh, that showed an increase of almost they almost tripled from what they they officially had to what they reported with, the, with that update. And so, since you don't really know what the physical supply is, it's it's impossible to say. Well, then I know what the real and again. Confusing value and price is a whole other story as well. And so, anyway, I don't mean to sound, you know, like I'm dancing around your question. What I'm <laughs> saying is, I think it's an impossible question to answer um, mm -hmm. with it with an actual number. You know, I, I'm not going to sit here and say, oh, I think the true actual price of gold is eighteen hundred dollars. I mean, that's I, I, I of or, course, and I'm also not going to say it should be ten thousand. Of course, but um, uh, but uh, I I figure it's um, it's like trying to value a currency. It's very difficult. But you know you can try to approach it. I mean, when people when people try to figure out the the original uh, parity between the U.S. dollar and the euro when it was created, they they sort of looked at the size of the European economy. They looked at the size of the U.S. economy, and it didn't give them a round number. But you know, it does give you some kind of idea. And then you look at interest rates and the differential right. between them, and economic growth and stability. It, it's extremely difficult, as you say, but we have to attempt it, right? Otherwise, what are we doing as analysts? Well, sure. And so from uh, from that standpoint, I've written before that I think that uh, this is probably at least a somewhat valid way of looking at it. If you took the stated M1, uh, just cash and equivalents money supply of the U.S., mm. and divided that by what the U.S. claims to have in ounces of gold, you get something around, no, oh, I don't know, $7,000 dollars an ounce. Exactly. Uh, if you take a more broader measure of the money supply, the M2, and divide again, if you want to just accept what the U.S. says they have at Fort Knox and at West Point and in the Federal Reserve Bank in New York, if you take those numbers of what the U.S. says they have in gold and divide it into M2, you get something more like $12,000 an ounce. Mm -hmm. So um, on a from a traditional sense, okay, that, that would probably be a good place to start. Well, in Mr. fact, would be in fact before Nixon closed the gold window, that was the official Bretton Woods equation. That was how right, it was exactly. done by central exactly. banks. So if we were to go back to that somehow, if gold were to somehow be revalued overnight, um, in, in that sense, that's where it would or should be. You mentioned physical inventory of bullion banks. Uh, there's been huge moves. And in fact, I think one of the only few sites to report it has been Zero Hedge. There's been huge moves in inventory recently. Yes, and we're, we're continuing to see that. And to me, it seems like it's all related. You know, we've heard the, it, well, not necessarily even anecdotal evidence. We had the situation with ABN AMRO back in, what was mm. it, March? Uh, which That's was right. essentially a default on their part, where they just said, look, we're not going to give you your gold. We're just going to give you cash at whatever the, the current bid is mm. uh, on this custodial relationship. There have been other Again, now this gets more to the anecdotal and hearsay stories about other bullion banks that you know are either just outright saying we don't have it to their customers or making them wait months for uh, to actually get their hands on metal if they're able to do it. 
And of course, we all remember MF Global, which actually just simply didn't even pay out. They closed all the gold positions and paid out in cash if they paid out at all. At, at all. I've got people uh, that uh, visit my site that had certificates for 5,000 ounces of silver that mm. just gone, poof. And, I, and I, obviously that's the risk. And that's why there's this, it's like the treasury market. You can either, uh, if you're a money manager, sit there and wait for rates to go higher, or you can all head for the exits at once, as we have saw in May and into June. The same thing is true of your allocated metal or unallocated metal accounts that you're mm-hmm. holding at these bullion banks. You can either sit there with your fingers crossed and say, well, I got this statement and I've got this certificate, says I own it. The problem is you and about 10 other people have the same certificate. Hmm. And if you show up there after they do, there's no way you're getting your medal. And and so anyway, yes, I think the bullion banks are stressed. I think the entire LBMA system is fracturing at the seams. That's all uh, related to the price move that you've seen here over the last nine months. Hmm. It, it will all sort itself out, I'm pretty confident, in the remaining six months of 2013. And, and we're... <laughs> We're going to have ourselves a rather interesting uh, time ahead, uh, no question in my mind. Mm, that Chinese curse. Uh, may you live in interesting times. Well, that's right. That's right. And, and, uh, and, and in this case, China is some of the cause of those interesting times. Or not, not necessarily the cause, but they are the benefactor and in using the interesting, interesting times uh, to their benefit. In fact, one of, the, one of those um, embassy wires that were leaked um, not so long ago, reported that China was saying that the U.S. and Europe have always suppressed the price of gold. Well, and, and how could how could you not come to that conclusion? I mean, anyone. This isn't complicated. It just take it's just a function of whether you want to research it yourself and follow the markets as you and I do, and as Mister Turk does, and and all these other analysts, and you you rapidly figure out that something is really wrong with the way the metals trade. And you begin to research it and you figure out and then you just simply connect the dots. And it makes I don't want to say it makes sense that the uh, that the the central Western central banks through their agents, the, these uh, these bullion banks seek to suppress and manipulate the price. But um, that that you can see why they do it mm. and and, under, and understand what they're attempting to accomplish in doing it. And if you're the Chinese working under a. Um, what probably had been a 50-year plan, which became a 20-year plan, which is now finally in the final years of that plan, you're glad to let the Western banks essentially uh, fall, uh, commit Harry Carey. <laughs> There's a Chinese and a Japanese reference putting them together for you, Felix. See, I can do this all day. Uh, so anyway, uh, you're glad to let them do that by suppressing the price to try to prop up their own currencies. And you're just buying, converting more and more of your dollar reserves into this hard asset that now you're going to back your own currency with in the, sometime in the very near future. In fact, when we talk about gold manipulation, it's not even hidden or secret. It's official policy. And it used to be even more public official policy in the London gold pool. And uh, just before the 70s, that was actually almost an international treaty. And you see how that and you see how that turned out, Felix. And again, it's, I I think, a good um, metaphor for where we are now in that you, you cannot suppress price against a physical, fundamental, uh, underlying demand for an, uh, an infinite period of time. Yeah, if Eventually, you... it breaks down. Exactly. I mean, it's the age-old lesson that uh, politicians seem to be intent on forgetting. Uh, price controls lead to, if you fix the price too low, it leads to excess supply. If you fix the pl- price too high, it leads to shortages, as uh, the Argentinians and, and the Venezuelans are finding to their distaste at the moment. Exactly. And, and what happened to the London gold pool is exactly what's happening now. Mm. And again, it's, it's not going to it's all going to sort out basically the same way. And, and gold will be allowed eventually to seek some actual equilibrium once we do, as we talked about earlier, once we figure out how much there actually is and in, in whose hands it is and how much is actually for sale at a certain exchange price. Mm. In fact, the parallels between the current situation and the 
the 1970s and 80s gold bull market. Well, 60s and 70s. I mean, 81 was the was the peak. Uh, is are uh, huge. The parallels just uh, they they. I mean, the the way that uh, gold moved after the Nixon uh, Nixon closed the gold window is amazing because he he was so sure that uh, so many economists were so sure that gold was actually going to go down after the dollar was delinked from it. <laughs> Yeah, all of a sudden gold would have less value, basically, <laughs> is what they were saying. Uh, yeah, and 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 if you lay a, uh, I've seen some charts that lay the current the last ten years over that ten year period as well, and and how the price kind of correlates with that, <clears throat> and then the chart kind of mirror each other. What I would suggest to you though is there's not going to be an end like there was in 1981, you know, where. Uh, all of a sudden, Paul Volcker decided to wring out all of the excess money supply and raise interest rates as much as he did. Uh, that is an impossibility at this state in the Keynesian decline. They're just that they're just not going to be able to do that for all the reasons I mentioned earlier. What interest rates would do to the federal budget deficit, what interest rates would do to the U.S. economy. Uh, and plummet tax revenues, which would then make more borrowing have to, you know what I mean? The, yeah, the, the whole size thing of it. Rapidly. Just the, the size of it. It's far too big. Exactly. And so that type of ending, which caused the gold price to peak in 1980 and 81 and then decline, uh, that type of ending is not coming this time. I mean, we we may have traded in kind of a similar pattern uh, for the last few years as the 70s, but that type of spike up and then a smash down. That is not coming this time. There's going to be a spike up and a reset and a revaluation that will be coming. Mm. Ne- nevertheless, I mean, I was looking at um, hedge funds uh, holdings of gold, well, of gold, paper paper gold, obviously, because that's the only thing that they report publicly. Right. And they still have so little. Even, I mean, right. the, some hedge funds have a lot and they make all the headlines. But if you look at the top 100 hedge funds, they have less than 0.6%. Well, a current price is probably right. less than 0.5% of the investment funds in gold. It's, right. uh, so, so, and- so there could be some kind of uh, hyperbolic spike at the end of the bull market if they all rush in. That doesn't mean... Oh, my gosh. And... Mm. I'm sorry, Felix. No, I didn't mean on, to interrupt you. On. I apologize. Go on. Uh, that, uh, try relating uh, the amount of paper metal that the hedge funds say that they are long, whether it's an ETF or whatever, and even add in the amount of physical metal if you can get any reports, and then lay that against the amount of paper metal that other hedge funds are now short. Hmm. I mean, we just got a report yesterday. Uh, of the amount of uh, of hedge, you know, we get the commitment of traders report every uh, every week, and the hedge funds that are now net short paper contracts that have moved from a massive net long position net short, I, I, it'd be interesting to lay out. I've not seen it done. Uh, heck, I'm an analyst. Maybe I should take the time to do this myself. <laughs> uh, I, I to to say the stated paper. Uh, holdings of the speculative hedge fund community, and then lay that against the reported um, short holdings of Comex paper. I would imagine if you you know multiply that out, you know, times 100 ounces uh, per contract, and how many contracts that is, and how many that how many ounces that works out to, out to be, they're probably more net short paper than they are physically long the actual metal. I mean, other funds. Do you see what I mean? Mr. Ferguson, I'd be very interested in seeing your report on that. Very much so. Yeah, yeah it'd be hard to pull all that together. I did get accurate information, but I just as I kind of conjecture that and ponder it, I wouldn't surprise me at all to think that there are more hedge funds and it's a different batch. I mean, there might be some hedging of physical position, who knows? But so there's a little bit of crossover there. But I'd say that there is a much larger group of hedge funds with a much bigger position that is short COMEX futures and there is a group of hedge funds that is long actual metal. Mm. We don't have much more time, but uh, I'd like to ask you about um, Bitcoin and what do you think about that? I am uh, I'm not a Bitcoin proponent um, and never have been. And what concerns me about it is the digital nature of it. I mean, it's what... We here in the U.S., you see these stories every once in a while about what do we even have cash for? It's a pain in the butt, you know, and it gets wad up, and you drop coins in your couch, and mm. why can't we just be a completely digital society? 
I think the encroachment on personal liberty and freedom that would come from being a completely society is would be a disaster. Of course, but uh, of but we know that we know that the governments are going to try and push on us some kind of digital currency that they can totally control. So sure. this is like a preemptive strike, right? This is one that they can't control. Well, fees, I, Felix, I tell you what, man. From everything we've heard um, out of the the Snowden uh, information that you know with Prism and everything else, uh, boy, I I am reluctant to believe that Bitcoin is not something that they can ultimately control too. Perhaps, perhaps <laughs> that's that's what we consider. I I would be much more happy to just continue to stack sound physical money that I can hold in my possession than to fiddle around with Bitcoin. But that's just my personal opinion. I mean, I believe me, I could be dead wrong, but that's just how I feel about it. Um, we have time for a couple more things. Um, I'd like to talk to you about the. I know it's very difficult, and uh, we all make mistakes when we try and predict. In fact, nobody should predict, but. Ah, we had to try at least. Sure. When do you think uh, these things we have been talking about will come to a head? When do you think we're going to start seeing big problems in the U.S. Treasury market? When do you think gold is going to start to break out? You know, if I've learned anything from my uh, now, I guess, three years as a this kind of public uh, analyst, um, and then in the five years since the financial crisis of 2008, if I've learned anything – it is the uh, to not underestimate the powers of the powers that be to hang on to their power. Hmm. Um, I, I think we all sat back in 2009 and went, well, geez, this is all good. I mean, they can't keep this together very long. I mean, look at these balance sheets. The, the banks are deep in, you know, they're all basically insolvent with all these securities and their derivatives and everything else on top of it. But here we are in 2013 and some level of normalcy still exists. And so to sit, the, so the hard part is to sit there and look at it and go, look, this can't continue. They're leveraged 100 to 1. It's a fractional reserve system. All the stuff that we talked about earlier in this call. Um, so you would think, I mean, it should have all broken down yesterday. It mm. should have all broken down years ago. And so to sit there and say, I think by the end of the year, it's all, regardless of that though, I, I, I really do believe that the, everything that's taken place in the last nine months has been a positioning move. The, the banks, through years of, uh, I guess, a, a, almost like a business plan of leasing gold and using that as a carry trade, have built up these huge short positions. And they've been able to manage the price through those short positions. QE to infinity changed that math. And mm -hmm. it became clear. I mean, if, again – you and I can figure this out. The Chinese can figure this out. The people that run the bank can figure this out. The Fed can. They know that this isn't going to continue. And so the only – this move has been so counterintuitive since September of last year that it has to be orchestrated. And it's orchestrated to the for the express purpose of getting these banks out from under those short positions. And they have now – if you look at these latest reports, they have now done it. And the banks, the U.S. banks, are now net long. Just, so just in time for Basel three to make uh, to make gold a tier one a tier one asset. So basically, money again. Exactly. And so all of this now has been done. So can it continue? Sure. You know what? If the if the specs want to continue selling paper gold, and if they want to continue driving price lower, hell, the banks aren't going to knock yourselves out. Hey, we're just going to keep buying as much as you want to sell to us. But at some point the lines kind of cross for them and you have this physical demand that they're trying to meet with, you know, withdrawals from the GLD or whatever. But at some point it will benefit the banks to go ahead and turn the price and begin to squeeze these paper speculative shorts. Mm. Then all of a sudden you'll start crossing moving averages to the upside and the specs will start covering and the whole move will uh, re unwind itself back up to the upside and it will catch a lot of people by surprise and this will all be finally behind us. When again, when okay, yeah, I don't think this will continue much longer because I think we're now at that point where it works for the banks to let price go ahead and go up. But we could still work our way through the summer doldrums and get all the way into September. Who knows before price finally bottoms? Mm. 
Right. How's so that for a long end? Yes, that's actually actually not long enough. I'd like to go on, but we are running out of time, so I'm going to say goodbye here. Uh, we were here with TF uh, TF Metals uh, Todd Ferguson. Thank you very much for being here on the Gold Money Podcast. We will have you back soon. Thanks, Todd. Felix, my pleasure. Thank you. Subscribe to the Gold Money newsletter at www.goldmoney.com to receive email updates on new articles, videos, and iTunes podcasts from our Gold Research section. Well, exactly. Uh, this is nothing surprising that has turned out this way. It had years of prosperity or what seemed to be prosperity. But in the end, again, the math is a certainty and it, it, it falls. I, Felix, it makes me think. I, I just read, I just took a vacation, which was great fun. And, and while I was on vacation, I read this new book from Dan Brown, you know, the, <laughs> the uh, Da Vinci Code guy. Yeah, sure. And it, at, at it, the book itself is about a, a, a guy that wants to, uh, is worried about world population growth. Okay. And how it it has grown exponentially. Okay. Without getting into whether that's a valid concern or whatever. And what I was, as I was reading it, I kept thinking and extrapolating that instead to world debt growth and how Mm -hmm. you can look at these problems and either bury your head in the sand and go back to kind of a denial fallback position to help you feel better that, well, you know, kind of a normalcy bias. So I don't even want to think about that. Or you can recognize it for what it is, a mathematical certainty that this isn't going to end well, and you can begin to prepare for it yourself. And that's what that's what we try to do at TF Metals Report. I I don't want to get into the whole uh, the math. Uh, U.S. Um, sovereign debt is standing at over 100 percent of GDP. Yes. Correct? Mm-hmm. And uh, and basically the the U.S. Um, Federal Reserve is buying. Um, increasing proportions of every single debt issue that comes out, every single new issue, right? And they're also they're also buying up stuff from other people, from banks and so on, of the um, outstanding debt. So they, as you say, they're becoming the treasury market. Exactly, and they're now put themselves in this position where they have no other option but to continue. And they, you know, the interesting thing about the last six weeks or so is the move in interest rates even while the Fed is propping up the market. I mean, mm-hmm. that's rather astonishing. The 10-year Treasury note in the U.S. has gone from 1.6% to 2.7%. Mm. I mean, that's a move of, what, 60%? Yes, and, I mean, that, it's just, and it's actually very interesting how many people have been spooked by it because you can see huge, even in very traded stocks like, say, Apple, uh, you can have huge moves in the price of the stock and some people get worried, some don't. But whenever the Treasury... MetalsReport.com. TF is Turd Ferguson, MetalsReport.com. And I highly recommend it. Uh, so the tagline, the tagline for your website is the end of the road for Keynesianism. And you've, yes. been, you've been telling us about how the, the current economic model based on uh, uh, Keynesianism and also the, you could say the Chicago Monetary School, but they're really using the same methodology as Keynesianism and they have most of the same ideas, right? Sure, yeah. And, and uh, it, Sorry, go on. No, no, I, I apologize I, I, for stepping on what you were saying. It is, though, that is kind of the tagline, is that this, this experiment, this Keynesian experiment has been going on now for the better part of, what, 80 years uh, maybe almost 90. And uh, it, it's reached the end of the road, which is just a mathematical certainty. And it, it, you can either deny that or you can accept it for what it is. I mean, it, at some point, the math just fails to work any longer. This this leveraged debt-based fractional reserve system falls on its own. Uh, and, and that's where we are. Has it ever not fallen follow, on its own? Because this has been tried before many times in history, hasn't it? The information contained in this podcast is an expression of opinion and does not constitute investment advice. This is the Gold Money Podcast with Felix Moreno, keeping you up to date with expert opinion on precious metals and the markets. Hello and welcome to the Gold Money Podcast. I'm Felix Moreno and I'm here today with Todd Ferguson of TF Metals, one of the most interesting voices in the metals industry, runs a wonderful website. Hi, Todd. Felix Pleasure to visit with you. So, um, for those of us, uh, for those of our viewers and listeners who haven't actually listened to your previous appearances on Gold Money, tell us a bit about TF Metals and what you do there. 
Well, it's a website specifically dedicated to uh, owning, trading, stacking, physical, precious metal, be it gold or silver. I, I kind of fell into this a couple of years ago through my involvement with a website called Zero Hedge. Uh, I, I like to think it's different. It, uh, the, it's a friendly community. We're all there to help each other. There's not people that tear each other down or post inflammatory things. And so I invite people to check it out. It's TF... World population growth, uh, the big, no, no, because, I I, because it could take his ages. I mean, it's a very interesting topic. But uh, personally, I happen to like people. I don't mind if we have more of them. But uh, on the other hand, debt... Uh, debt doesn't need to grow exponentially. There's been long periods in history when it hasn't. And uh, every time it has grown exponentially, it's ended up in disaster, hasn't it? Exactly. And, and again, that's where we are now. And that's why this idea, um, I just laugh, it's laughable, this idea that the Fed is somehow going to extricate themselves from uh, essentially being the U.S. Treasury market, which is what they've become at $85 billion a month, mm. the idea that now they can step away and not have a, a terribly detrimental impact on interest rates and then economic growth and tax revenues. I mean, it, the entire thing will rapidly spiral out of control if the Fed were to try to uh, exit. In fact, their really only option, and it's written in the FOMC minutes, is to potentially increase quantitative easing that's more likely than than decrease and exactly. again it's just simply the math who's yeah let, let's look at the math 